global community science opportunity that you can take part in as well um, just in the next few weeks here. It's, it's in February. Um, so I wanted to just share a little bit with you about Denver Audubon and, and who I am and kind of my role with the organization. And then we're going to do some really fun kind of interactive backyard bird ID and also chat a little bit about bird feeders. Um, a lot of people are starting to engage in bird watching and feeding birds, especially since um, um, we still are kind of being encouraged to socially distance and stay at home. And so putting out a bird feeder and engaging with your local neighborhood birds is a great way to pass your time from day to day. And the birds in winter are a really great time to start with your local bird ID, especially if you're kind of a beginner. Um, I started birding about six years ago. And when I started, I really didn't know much of anything. I knew some of our raptors. Um, I, I knew maybe a couple of songbirds, but it's kind of incredible to me that just in the last few years, by opening up my ears and opening up my eyes and really starting to understand more about where the birds are in the landscape and what they sound like, I see and I experience so much more as a result of that. So if you're not familiar with uh, Denver Audubon, we do some local birding field trips and some workshops. Um, a lot of our field trips are free. We offer those in a variety of different locations. Um, as Amy was mentioning, Sandstone Ranch, we've done birding field trips down there. We've done other types of Douglas County open spaces, we do Jefferson County open spaces, and then we also have a partnership with Denver Parks and Recreation. Um, so we're hoping that we can return to a lot of those in-person field trips within the next year. So if you've never done a free birding field trip with us, I highly encourage you to check them out. You just go to www.denveraudubon.org and see what we have coming up. Um, and then we also have an Audubon Master Birder program. So if you're somebody who, is maybe an intermediate birder, you've been birding for a long time and you're thinking about maybe taking that to the next level, this could be a great year to do that. So we only take applications for that program every other year since it is a very intensive program. Um, we do have to have about a year in between to plan, but it's evening classes um, this past year over Zoom. So we did Monday evening classes and then Saturday field trips. Um, and it's a small class, usually only about 11 or 12 participants. And then you also have a mentor that helps you go through the program. Um, and then we do school programs as well with kindergarten through 12th grade, all the way up through some of our colleges and universities. Um, so I just started a class with Red Rocks Community College this week, actually. And um, that's helping to train some of the people that are learning to be park rangers and will eventually be stationed in some of our open spaces um, and our uh, parks, our state parks, or even national forests or national parks potentially. And then we have a non-wildlife research grant as well. So we actually provide money for wildlife research across Colorado. Um, and there's a lot of nonprofits and individuals that apply for that. So lots of great things going on. And then of course, this outreach program here and um, that you all are participating in. I offer a lot of these different types of programs with a number of agencies and organizations, and it's probably my favorite part of my job. So if you haven't joined us as a local member um, to support our educational programs, that would be a really wonderful thing for you to do. Um, we are, are funded just by the Scientific and Cultural Facilities District, which is a grant program. Um, and then a lot of our local members and supporters just in the Denver metro area who believe in, in the work that we do. So when we're talking about winter and kind of some of these great tips for bird watching, you know, this is a wonderful time to start engaging with those year round residents. You know, once we start to get into April and May, everything starts to change with spring migration. So we get a lot more birds in the state, which can be a little bit more confusing for people that are just starting out. So winter time is a really great opportunity to learn about some of our year round residents, birds that are here with us all the time. They might not leave Colorado, they might move seasonally from place to place. So you might see more of them in and around your neighborhoods and you might see them in um, kind of your local open 
open spaces. And then in the summer, they might go somewhere else. They might switch and be up at the top of Mount Evans. So it's good to kind of familiarize yourself and build relationships with a lot of those birds that are here with us all the time. And then when we think about um, kind of our open spaces and our yards, these provide really critical winter habitat for birds. And so when birds are looking for resources in the winter, when conditions are especially harsh, being able to find things like a reliable source of water and a reliable source of food are really important for their survival. You know, they're not stressed out right now with trying to feed babies. They're just really trying to kind of get through those colder winter months in preparation for when spring will return and a lot of them will begin nesting again. So when we are thinking about the types of birds that are going to be coming in and out of our backyard landscapes and also the birds that are here with us year round, there's really specific types of adaptations that those birds have to be able to help us and help them with their survival. So they have usually a, a conical shaped beak or a long kind of pointed beak. So they might be a granivore. Um, so that's gonna be a bird that mostly relies on grain or plant material for their survival. Um, or they might be some sort of a specialist seed eater. So that would be something like a red crossbill um, where they've got this really unique and different beak shape to help them crack open certain types of seeds and nuts. You also might consider things um, like some of our corvids, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, where we have these birds that typically are omnivores, and so they change what they eat seasonally. But because they're able to do that, they can stay here with us year round. Um, and they have a, a long pointed beak that's very strong, and that allows them to be able to crack open seeds and acorns. Um, as well as our nut hatches. So when we think about the birds that are here, a lot of these birds right now are, are gonna have beaks of certain shape. And then our insectivores that predominantly eat insects are gonna be returning to us in the spring, summer uh, for that nesting season when our insect populations return. Now what's really interesting though is as our climate continues to change and shift, we're seeing a lot of birds seasonally that we wouldn't normally be seeing here so early in the winter. So for example, um, we have seen these uh, particular type of warbler, which is the songbird, um, but we've seen yellow rumped warblers in January in northern Denver, um, which doesn't really make a ton of sense because warblers typically eat insects. And so you wouldn't expect to see them here in the wintertime. But a fascinating adaptation that the yellow rumped warbler has is unlike other warblers, they've been able to figure out how to exploit certain types of food um, like fruit. And so being able to actually switch and consume more types of fruit in their diet allows them to be able to come northward and kind of cheat migration a little bit to be able to feed off of some of those berries that we still have present in January, February, March, things that might be left over that never fell off. Um, so there's a lot of really kind of wonderful birds that are here that are with us year round, but then we also get these kind of cool migrants that like to cheat the system and show up here um, in the winter months from the south. The other really fascinating thing that happens is we have a lot of birds that migrate from northern areas down into Colorado in the winter. So we're not really going to go through some of those seasonal migrants here today, um, but some of the things that you might consider seeing are certain types of raptors and certain types of waterfowl like ducks. Um, and then also you might notice that there's a huge influx of geese here in Colorado um, in the winter months. And that's because we do have the residential populations that live here and that breed here and actually don't leave Colorado. But then you have populations that do actually migrate further down south in the winter months, um, as well as cackling geese. So cackling geese and Canada geese, they look very similar, um, but they are two separate species but they often will flock together. Um, so lots of just great birds to kind of 
get you through those winter months and as you start to maybe feel a little bit of the winter blues, it's great to go out and be able to look at some of those birds and, and get to know them and be familiar. So um, the winter birds, again, the reason why they're here is they've switched their diet to dine on seeds. So seeds are a great food source because they don't go bad, right? They, they don't really have um, a shelf life that is super short the way an insect piece of food might have or a berry that's going to, you know, go bad and mold over time. We know that as humans, we eat a ton of seeds, a ton of nuts. They have a long shelf life. They can be in your pantry for a while. Um, you can also go and you can stash them. You can hide them in different places. You might find a small little baggie of cashews at the bottom of your purse and go, oh, sweet. I forgot those were in there. And a couple months later, they might still be just fine. Um, and so birds have figured have figured this out as well, right? These are high in fat and high in protein, and they can also fly to your bird feeder, steal however many seeds and nuts they might want, and fly off and hide them somewhere else to be able to go back and locate them later. And birds have incredible memories. So they're able to actually hide, it's called caching, when we're talking about wildlife that hides things. So caching is C-A-C-H-E. They're caching their food. And that allows them to, be go, to go back and be able to locate food, especially if we have something like a really terrible snowstorm. You know, if the if the ground gets covered with snow, maybe we get dumped on 12 inches, you know, over the course of a few hours, a bird can go back to a particular tree where maybe they've stashed a few seeds behind the bark of, say, a plains cottonwood, where they've got that nice bark that kind of splits open, especially as they age. And so that's a really wonderful way for birds to be able to survive some of those harsher weather conditions um, and be able to make it in between snowstorm to snowstorm. In the front range, obviously, we don't really experience that as much um, just because we don't have as much snowfall, but that's also really, really important behavior for birds that live high up in the mountains um, at higher elevations to be able to cache their food so that they can go back and find it later, especially if they don't have a reliable source um, for bird seed in the form of a bird feeder. So this little bird right here, um, I don't know if, if we have some advanced birders or if we've got some intermediate birders or maybe some beginning birders, um, but this is one of the first birds that I began talking to. So when I was a, a young girl growing up in Oklahoma, I used to have these on our neighbor's house and they would call in the morning and I would call back. Little did I know that that would be foretelling of where my career would take me um, for working for Denver Audubon. So that's kind of fun. Um, but that's a morning dove. Uh, if you are familiar with our doves here in Colorado, um, that's a, a morning dove, which is our native species of dove that we have here. And then our conifer trees, those are a really important source for seeds in the winter, a natural form of seeds in the winter. Um, and so it really allows a lot of these birds to be able to, again, when everything else is covered in snow or a lot of maybe the perennials, the stems have snapped off. And so, you know, the food is buried or it's already been eaten by other animals. Having the ability to be able to fly up into a conifer tree and be able to actually remove some of those nuts and seeds out of the pine cones themselves is a, a really great adaptation to have and to take advantage of. Um, so a lot of our birds that are here, again, in the winter, have the ability to be able to have these really strong beaks to be able to fly into some of these um, and be able to uh, have the ability to find food that way. Um, and then another kind of group of plants that's often overlooked for their food resources are our native grasses. So a lot of our birds that are here right now are going to be, again, those granivores. So they're going to be birds that are going to be going after small seeds too. And so this is really important, having these kind of smaller, um, more easily kind of picked off and eaten seeds in the form of grasses for things like our sparrows 
or our juncos. So a lot of our juncos that like to feed from the bottom of a landscape rather than up in the top of a tree. So these are really critical for them to be able to fly in and have a winter food source. The other issue that happens a lot though is in our landscaping, people have a tendency to want to clean up all of the dead plant material in the fall. And we as people um, at Denver Audubon that wanna encourage the creation of wildlife habitat advise against that um, because so many birds will utilize these grasses and other types of plants over winter in addition to artificial bird feeding opportunities um, that we wanna encourage you to leave your yard or your property as messy as you possibly can. Um, and go ahead and just let, let that seed stay there because a lot of winter birds will fly in and um, they will, will go ahead and you know take, take a lot of these seeds and be able to utilize them for, for food. Um, so Jan had a question about which birds eat seeds from blue spruce pine cones. Um, well, I would think probably nuthatches, woodpeckers. Um, I would have to go back bird by bird specifically um, and, and check to see which exact species have all been observed eating blue spruce pine cones. Um, so, you know, if you go to allaboutbirds.org, um, which is the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. That's where all of my bird feeding information comes from um, because every single bird profile in North America, if you click into it, it will give you a list of every type of plant, insect, berry, or anything else that that bird has ever been observed eating. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to our, our conifer trees, just overall, I know that there's a lot of woodpeckers that eat from them. There's um, Clark's Nutcracker, which is a corvid actually related to our blue jays and um, our ravens and our crows. Um, so there's a lot of birds that will, will eat those cones, but I'd have to go back again and look specifically species by species on blue spruce in particular. So sorry, I don't have that exact information memorized tonight. Sorry, I'm trying to now close the question. I'm gonna close that box so I can- It doesn't look open. We're, the way sorry. we're viewing it, it doesn't look open. Okay, that's all right, good. Cause I, I, needed, to, I needed to close it so that I could see. <laughs> So this is another um, wonderful group of plants often overlooked for the um, seed production. So this is, you know, a lot of different perennials. These are in the aster family. So these are gonna be things like prairie cone flower, um, Mexican hat, uh, blanket flower. You're, there's a lot of different plants that are in the aster family. And so when you think about where our sources of artificial seed come, artificial, but you know, cultivated seed come from that get put in our bird feeders, a lot of those come from different plants in the aster family. So if you're looking for actually being able to plant some plants and keep them around and keep them uncut in the winter season so that birds can feed from them naturally, this is another great just example of some native plants that you might want to choose. Um, if you would really like to learn a lot more about native plants, next Thursday, the 28th of January, um, I will be doing a Native Plants for Birds workshop with the Douglas um, County Conservation District. So I don't know if you guys have heard of the Douglas County Conservation District, but they're over in Franktown. Um, and they have a couple of other free workshops that they sponsor as well. So we're really gonna delve into the meat of Native Plants for Birds next week with them. Um, and also some of the different plants that they have for sale, being able to kind of recommend and what some of those might be able to do for you. Um, so as a kind of a substitute for a lot of these native plants, 
Um, there are many, many options for artificial heating. So these are just a few examples. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can artificially feed birds, but I like to, of course, cover this um, because a lot of people do enjoy feeding birds in the winter. It is, however, a personal choice because sometimes you might attract wildlife that you don't necessarily want to attract like trash pandas, AKA raccoons. Um, also lots of squirrels like to come to bird feeders, of course. And so given who you are and kind of what sorts of things you would like to deal with, you may or may not uh, want to artificially feed birds. Um, so there's lots of different options as we show here. Suet feeders are the a great thing to use in winter. So we don't recommend that you use suet feeders in the summer because it just melts. Um, but winter time is a great time to put out a suet feeder if you're gonna put out anything at all. Um, and then some other great options include things like black oil sunflower. And then there's a great community science opportunity down here at the bottom. If you look, Project Feeder Watch, that's the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And that is a community science opportunity where you can just watch birds at your bird feeders all year round and then submit your observations to the Cornell Lab. And they really rely on a lot of people to be able to, to submit those observations. So here's again some of that, um, just some examples of our different food items. And there's a lot of different bird seed out there, but it's not all created equal. So I want to make sure that we kind of touch a little bit on when you're buying types of artificial seed that you're aware um, when you're feeding wildlife in the winter, what is in your seed? So the seed on the left is called the red milo. And there are certain types of bird seed that have what we call fillers in them. And so filler seed is basically just a junk seed that they use to fill up the bag to make it look heavier um, and to make it way heavier without it necessarily having nutritional value for birds. So it's kind of important, just like when you read food labels for yourself, when you're consuming things, that you read food labels on the bird seed that you buy. So in this particular sample, red milo is a very small percentage of the overall seed uh, selection. So white millet is a great small seed. It's in a lot of mixes. If you've bought something called like a complete patio blend, you know, oftentimes it's things like white millet, black oil, sunflower, um, cracked or hold sunflower included, and then safflower as well. So this is a good mix because you'll notice the percentage of red milo is fairly low, or you can buy mixes that have no milo in it at all. You compare that to this particular brand, and they found that this brand had almost half of the bag as being red Milo. And so that is going to start to kind of make you question, huh, okay, it, it might be cheaper, but is it going to actually provide the nutritional value needed for those birds? And then the other thing that's in there is cracked corn. Cracked corn is utilized by some birds, but not very many. Um, and just like with, with people, with humans, cracked corn tastes delicious, but it passes through you pretty quickly. So it doesn't have the best nutritional value out there. Um, so when you're starting to go and kind of shop and think about, you know, what could you put out or what could you plant to help attract more birds to your backyard? Um, black oil sunflower is the number one chosen food source of most backyard birds. And there are people that have sat there and they have watched backyard birds and they have counted how many birds have grabbed a black oil sunflower seed as opposed to other types of seed being offered. And so it tends to be preferred by more species than anything else. And what's great about black oil sunflower is that you can buy 50 pound bags of it and you will actually be appealing to a wide variety of birds and other wildlife. Um, you can also plant it though, so you don't even necessarily have to buy it. If you have already established garden beds or you have maybe 
a, a part of your property that's just kind of an open field. Maybe you haven't done much with it. Uh, a lot of our native sunflower species do really well on neglect and no water. Um, and they also are really beneficial for our birds as a winter food source. So this is an incredible photo by a gentleman named Rob Palmer. Um, he is a retired ornithologist. He comes out to our nature center and takes a lot of photos. Um, and then he shares photos with me for our educational program. So um, this is a great example of how a black capped chickadee is just gonna fly right in there and pick a lot of seeds out of these dead seed heads and be able to use that for a winter food source. There was a really fascinating study that was done um, that's mentioned in an incredible book called Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy. Uh, if you haven't read it, I would highly recommend that you add it to your winter reading list because they, they did a study where they watched a female black capped chickadee over the course of the winter and kind of watched her food source, where she was getting food from, what types of seeds she was eating. And then they compared that to other females um, and kind of what their what their food consumption was and how much access they had to feeders and other types of native plants. And they found that the black capped chickadee females that have more access to seed in the winter are able to get enough vitamins and nutrients to have better success with rearing young and laying eggs in the spring. And so you kind of think about that in comparison to humans. If we're able to get enough prenatal vitamins into our body, that really helps us with being able to have healthy babies and healthy pregnancies. And the same is true for black capped chickadees and their ability to be able to eat that seed over the course of the winter months. So for a long time, you know, we could anecdotally say, yes, Winter seed sources are really critical for birds, but what's awesome now is Doug Tallamy and some of his um, colleagues that have started to really do the research over the last 15 years have given us the numbers to prove it. And then the other thing that's wonderful about sunflowers in the springtime as they start to bloom in spring and summer is that they also support our native bee population and a lot of our other native pollinators. So I'm not sure if you can see the pollinator in this picture, but if you look closely um, and really start to examine the center of that sunflower, you might see on the top right at about one o'clock, there is a green metallic sweat bee that's hanging out inside of this flower. And a lot of our pollinators love to come and land on these plants. And you'll see on the leaf to the right, there's a lot of great pollen that's dusted off of there. And so it, it's dual purpose, right? You've got food and resources for our pollinators in the spring and summer, and then you've got winter food sources for our birds. So it's just a win-win all around. And then the other thing I wanted to, to mention too, um, when we do talk about winter feeding and, and feeding wildlife, um, we definitely want to address the ethics around bird feeding. So if it's going to put another animal in danger or if it's going to put birds in danger, then it might be best to refrain from artificially feeding birds. And of course, a lot of us who have lived in Colorado for quite some time are aware of the correlation between bears and bird feeders. But we have a lot of people who are also moving here from all over the country that have never really had bears in their backyard. And so a lot of it can also be very innocent and just not realizing that there's a danger there. Um, so Colorado Parks and Wildlife, who is a very valued partner of ours, and we have a lot of discussions with them about a lot of different wildlife issues and educational opportunities. Um, they have shared with me, you know, a number of hot spots where bears and bird feeders were reported together as being an issue. And a lot of those hot spots include communities like Castle Pines and Castle Pines North, which probably won't surprise you if you um, are living in Douglas County, and also places like Roxboro, um, and then a lot of the places that kind of obviously butt up to the foothills. And what they're finding too is that bears are changing their behavior. So for a long time, we could tell people, just take your bird feeder in at night 
and that's fine. Um, and now what they're finding is that a lot of bears are out rummaging around even during the day. And the other thing to be aware of is with our um, kind of warmer winter days, you know, there are some bears that don't actually just hibernate throughout the entire winter. If it's if it starts to warm up, then that might kind of clue them to come out um, of hibernation for a little bit and kind of, you know, maybe roam around for a day or two and then and then go back in. So it's just good things to keep in mind that if um, if you might have a bear in your area or other types of wildlife, then perhaps artificial feeding isn't the best method. Perhaps planting native plants or providing a water source for those birds would be a better option. And then a lot of those winter birds, like I shared too, um, are gonna dine on berries. So different native shrubs like junipers and choke cherries and snowberries, um, there's all kinds of great native shrubs. So if you've got some room on your property to be able to plant them and let them spread, that's a wonderful thing to do. So this is a picture of a white crowned sparrow. This is an immature white crowned sparrow um, hanging out in three leaf sumac. Um, so three-leaf sumac is a wonderful native shrub that you can plant, um, and a lot of birds will come in even in the winter time and kind of pick off some of those residual berries that might be left behind um, or also use it for perching or use it for cover. And then a lot of winter birds search for open and flowing water. Um, so again, if you're not able to artificially feed, then being able to provide a reliable food source in your backyard um, is really critical. And if you want to find the greatest diversity of birds and other types of wildlife, you're going to want to go for where there's open and flowing water. Because in the winter months in Colorado, that is quite the commodity, especially as a lot of our smaller ponds um, freeze over entirely and then animals aren't able to access the water that they need. So if you have a heated water source or you provide a daily refill, um, you might actually get, you know, a whole group of birds gathering around the water cooler to have their daily gossip session. Um, in this case, we've got a number of American robins, which are a native thrush species. And then we've got some European starlings, which are a non-native invasive species. Um, so I always wonder, like, are the American robins chatting in an American accent and the the European starlings, do they all have a have like a British accent or Irish or Scottish, depending on where their ancestors came from before they got introduced to uh, to North America? So this is a great option for some birds that wouldn't normally actually come to your feeder and eat artificial seed. Since robins feed on berries in the wintertime, they're not going to take advantage of an artificial feeder, but they might absolutely take advantage of a water source. And then placing bird feeders um, and other types of sheltering options for wildlife is, is really critical to provide space in your landscape. So using um, hardscaping, things like logs or sticks or bird feeders or, um, you know, a platform, just even a covered platform that's not actually a bird house, um, it just has a little roof on it, can be great ways to create space for birds in and around your backyard habitat. And if you throw some seed under logs or on bushes or on tops of dead logs, there's a lot of birds that are gonna utilize that. And if you decide that you'd like to hang up bird feeders, you wanna put them in different locations. Some of them up high, maybe some of them a little lower down, putting them on opposite ends of your yard. And the reason being is because some birds, um, just like people, hate just being on top of each other all the time. And so I love this photo from one of our volunteers, uh, Dick Vogel, who took this picture. We've got a black capped chickadee who literally looks like he's yelling into the face of a bush tit since all the bush tits flew in at the same time as bush tits tend to do. And black capped chickadees like to kind of eat by themselves. Um, and so I just love uh, this great demonstration of how if you don't provide enough space in your yard, sometimes you might have some angry birds on your hands. And so really trying to kind of allow them that space is really helpful and, and critical too for them to be able to feel comfortable feeding in your yard. And then some of those final tips again, so high fat protein diet during the winter months. So things like suet um, as well as artificial seed can be used. A reliable source of water is key and then having cover or a safe place for them to hide. Now, one of the, um, 
questions we get all the time is what about the squirrels? I don't want a bunch of squirrels coming and eating my expensive bird seed. The Eastern Fox Squirrel, the population of these guys has most likely increased over the last few decades. A lot of this is kind of historical based on who's lived here for 40 years and who just moved here. Um, there's not a ton of data out there on Colorado specifically when it comes to the squirrel populations overall. Um, we are considered to be kind of the very western tip of their range, their North American range. So often they're called the Eastern Fox Squirrel. Um, and so there is a good chance that they have increased over the last few decades because our landscape here in the Front Range has changed a lot, um, especially in places like here in Parker, you know, we've added a lot of trees that historically would not have been here because this was a short to medium grass prairie 100 years ago. Um, and so squirrels obviously love their trees. And so if you've got a ton of squirrels and you've got a ton of trees and then you put out a bird feeder, they are just gonna be celebrating. Um, so there's a few things you can do. Uh, you can, if you wanna deter them, you can put out hot pepper suet. Um, they actually sell that. You can kind of sprinkle cayenne pepper around the base of your bird feeder. You can use baffles that you purchase to put on the pole. You can also, I've heard of people using Vaseline or Crisco to make the poles really slippery. Um, and if you really want to, if you've got a ton of time on your hands, you could sit on your back porch with a cup of coffee and maybe use a water gun to deter them from coming uh, to, your, to your feeders. Um, you could also have just a great time with your squirrels, maybe entertain yourself. So if you're not gonna beat them, you might as well invite them, right? You can build them a little picnic table, maybe a little house with a ladder and their own area with food, a little Lone Star Saloon, um, lots of great opportunities to just kind of enjoy and engage with your backyard squirrels if they're gonna be coming after your bird seed anyway. So lots of great, uh, lots of great ideas there. Um, and then if you have other ideas or, or questions about squirrel deter deterrence, some of our local birding stores, um, Wild Birds Unlimited down in Castle Rock, Front Range Birding Company over Kin Carroll um, area off of C470 and Kipling, they have lots of great ideas of just kind of what people have shared with them that's really worked well in neighborhoods to help with deterring squirrels if, if that's so what you desire. So for kind of these last few minutes of our time together, I wanted to review some of our common winter birds. So we'll just go through a few of these and this will help to give you some great background information and knowledge to get you ready to participate in the Great Backyard Bird Count as we hope that you all will. And um, we're gonna start with the hardest group of birds first. Um, everybody loves them. The sparrows, as some people call them little brown jobs or little brown birds, LBBs. I am not including the really difficult types of sparrows. Um, a lot of times, you know, that's best saved for a specialty workshop. But this will give you a good idea of what some of our kind of common sparrows would be that you might see. So our white crowned sparrow, love that they have that black and white zebra cap. It's a really easy sparrow to learn. If it's the first sparrow that you learn, um, that is a great place to start. And then you can kind of work your way up to some of the more difficult sparrows. The American tree sparrow, what's lovely about it is that it is here in the wintertime and there is another sparrow species that looks very similar, but it's a migrant. It comes here, shows up in spring and summer. And so that's where season really helps us out because if you see a bird with a rusty cap and then you'll also notice that this sparrow has a black top of its bill and an orange bottom of the bill. So it's called a bicolor bill. That can tell you that you've got an American tree sparrow because it is the winter. So the season helps us out. They're here 
hanging out with us in Colorado. And then as it starts to warm up up north and return to spring and summer, they will leave Colorado and head out. And then our house sparrow down there at the bottom is an invasive species. So this is the sparrow that you see hanging out in all of the juniper shrubs in front of your local King Supers. They are the birds that are hanging out in the rafters in Denver International Airport. Um, so they can really live well alongside man-made structures and they can eat a lot of things and survive on a lot of things that our native birds cannot, which is part of why they are so prolific. And then we also have two types of chickadees in Colorado. So given what part of Denver you live in, you might be most familiar with our black cap chickadee. But we actually also, a lot in some of the higher elevation parts of Douglas County, get the mountain chickadee. Um, and so it's really great to always kind of double check who is at your bird feeder or who is in your neighborhood if you hear a chickadee sound. Because on occasion, we will get these mountain chickadees that kind of will mix in and overlap their range with the black caps. Even though typically mountain chickadees prefer a little higher elevation, um, but it's really interesting with all of the wildfires that happened this fall, we saw flocks and flocks and flocks of mountain chickadees being reported all over Denver because I'm, I'm fairly certain that they were trying to escape the smoke and the fires that were up north so late into the season. And on occasion, our chickadees also get kind of confused with another little black and white bird that we have, um, which falls into a family of nuthatches. So we've got our red-breasted, our white-breasted, and our pygmy nuthatch. So the red-breasted on the left has that rufous kind of orangey red chest. The white-breasted has that real clear, very bright white chest. And then the pygmy is kind of more of a, of a gray color with a little bit of beige underneath. Um, and so these birds are so fun to watch. And they're also a great bird to learn by call because their calls are very distinct. So if you're looking at starting kind of practicing birding by ear and being able to use calls, um, a lot of times I hear nut hatches before I see them. They also have a unique behavior where they turn head first and go all the way down a tree trunk. And woodpeckers are not able to do that. So woodpeckers will go up a trunk, but they can't turn around and go back down head first. So these guys have special toes that allow them to be able to grip tight enough to go head first down a tree trunk. And that's a special adaptation of their family. This is another really fun bird that I just love to share, um, mostly because I don't see them that often. Given certain neighborhoods, they, there could be um, great populations of them, but they hang out alone most of the time. Um, and they're just a teeny tiny little bird, sometimes confused with a sparrow. But I find it easiest to see them in the winter because they actually will spiral upwards. They'll start at the base of a tree and then kind of go upwards like this. And they use that long beak to be able to pick out little insect larvae that might be overwintering inside of tree bark. So this is called a brown creeper. And creepers usually are a tropical species. There's a lot of creeper diversity as you go further south into Central and South America, but this is our creeper for Colorado. Um, and so they're really fun, but they blend in so well that sometimes winter is a great time to practice trying to find them and see them. And then we also have our woodpeckers. Who doesn't love woodpeckers? I love woodpeckers. They're incredible birds. Sometimes uh, people have a love-hate relationship with woodpeckers because of what they can do to our homes. Um, but they are a really critical uh, keystone family of birds since they excavate homes for so many other birds. So we have these two species here that are black and white, um, and there's a lot of confusion around them. Um, you know, if you haven't spent a ton of time looking at birds, so you've got our downy woodpecker on the left and our hairy woodpecker on the right. So the downy woodpecker has this teeny tiny little beak. And then you see the hairy woodpecker has a beak that is almost the same width as its skull. 
Um, and then the hairy woodpecker is slightly larger, but sometimes when you're looking at birds from a distance, size can be really challenging. Um, but these are two great birds also to know because if you put out a suet feeder, there's almost always a downy woodpecker that shows up and occasionally you might get a hairy woodpecker as well. This is our largest species of woodpecker, one of our larger species of woodpecker in the front range. Um, this is another really favorite of homeowners um, because they can be quite destructive, but I happen to love them. I love their bright colors. I love their personalities. I love their vocalizations. So this is called a Northern Flicker. And we've got a couple of different color variations of Northern Flicker in Colorado. So we have a red shafted. So you'll see right underneath um, and the shaft, which is the middle part of the feather, they have kind of an orangey color. And then the female is here on the right. So you can see that the male is a lot more colorful. He's got that red mustache. And then the female um, is a little bit more kind of gray. And then we have the yellow shafted. So this is a male of the yellow shafted and he's got that red dot and then also his mustache is black. But genetically, they are the same species. The yellow shafted tends to be more on the East Coast and then we see more of the red shafted here in the Western part of the United States and they can actually breed together and create a hybrid. So that's pretty cool if you're able to see that. And then these two birds often get confused with each other and then sometimes get confused with another bird who's not here in the winter. So we've got a spotted towhee and then again our American robin. So the spotted towhees, they hang out underneath a lot of shrubs. They have a special kind of foraging behavior where they kick up a lot of the leaf litter. So oftentimes you'll hear them scratching underneath a juniper tree or underneath um, scrub oak if you go hiking in the winter. And so these guys are looking for a lot of uh, overwintering insects. So they don't tend to come to feeders as often. It sort of depends on your neighborhood. Um, and if you've got other types of shrubs or juniper trees around, um, they don't really like to be out in the open. So if you have a neighborhood that's mostly grass and mostly trees and not a lot of shrubs, then you may not have the appropriate habitat for spotted towhee. Um, and then they do feed on the ground. So they are kind of like the cleanup crew. They come around and they eat some of those seeds that the other birds like to toss out. And then we've got a black-headed grosbeak, male and female, but these are summer only. So a lot of spring and summer. So a lot of grosbeaks migrate into Colorado. Um, they're not necessarily here year round. And then when we look at our birds in black, there's quite a number of them. We've got our red-winged blackbird, which is maybe one of the most recognized birds in North America. A lot of people know what they look like. Um, but the female causes a lot of confusion. So that female there in the middle really throws off a lot of, of people looking at birds in their backyard because it looks like a sparrow that's twice the size that she is supposed to be. Um, but this is actually a female red-winged blackbird. So if you have a huge sparrow that shows up at your feeder and you are not sure what's going on, um, maybe double check and think, oh, wait, 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 that might be a female red-winged blackbird, especially if you see male red-winged blackbirds around. And then also, again, that European starling that we saw earlier. And I love to show these two pictures because sometimes given the light, European starlings can look really iridescent and sort of beautiful rainbow colored. And then sometimes they look like they've got these spots, um, but it is definitely the same bird. And then a couple other birds in black are large corvids. And if you're interested in learning more about these guys and some of their behavior and natural history, we'll be doing another webinar with Douglas Land Conservancy on curious corvids um, and really getting a lot more into the nitty gritty of their natural history, their behavior, their diet, and all of that on February 9th. But this is our common raven on the left and our American crow on the right. So the common raven, if you look at that beak, it's huge and it's got a big hook. 
And also you'll see they kind of have a five o'clock shadow, it looks like underneath their chin. Um, they just look a little scraggly, a little more scraggly. Um, and then the American crow has a kind of a sharper, straighter beak, and they also look a little more glossy. Um, there's also differences in their vocalization. They do sound differently. Um, the common raven, I think, sounds like it's got a loogie caught in its throat, as opposed to an American crow where it's that very clear cawing sound. And then here's some of our other um, corvids. We're just gonna go through them real quick. Our large bluebirds. Um, oftentimes they get confused with regular bluebirds. People see you know, a very large bluebird and they think it's, it's a mountain bluebird, um, but the size isn't, isn't quite right. That's because it's, it's a jay. <laughs> so we've got our blue jays, our stellar's jays, our woodhouse's scrub jays, and then also our pinion jays. Um, so pinion jays, as their name might indicate, tend to prefer um, pinyon pine forest down in Southern Colorado. But every once in a while, you get some pinyon jays that like to head up um, into the front range area and into more of the Denver metro area, sometimes even as far up as like Fort Collins. So it's good to know the difference between all of the field marks. And so this is really helpful having all four pictures together because you see the pinion jay is more blue, a real deep royal blue, and your woodhouse's scrub jay is going to be more of that grayish kind of um, tinted blue. So lots of great jays to learn. And then of our doves and our pigeons, we met the morning dove earlier. A couple of them, unfortunately, are invasive. Um, so our Eurasian collar dove is being seen more and more and displacing our native morning dove um, because they, they eat similar things, they share similar habitats. Um, and so that's kind of a shift we've been seeing over the last few years. And then we've got four different types of dark eyed juncos. Um, so when you report birds, a dark eyed junco is pretty decent for, for any bird list. If you really want to start getting into some of these different color patterns and reporting them as gray headed or slate or pink sided or Oregon, um, that's a great thing to do if you are doing something like the great backyard bird count and you want to get more specific about the color. But the dark eyed juncos, again, they're all one species. Their colors just exhibit themselves differently given the parents, you know, your genetics, blondes, brunettes, redheads. And then if you see a dash of yellow fly in, um, it could potentially be an American goldfinch and non-breeding plumage. So American goldfinch hang out with us all season, all year long, but they lose that bright yellow and black coloration. Um, and then also the pine siskin has just a dash of yellow on the wings. So if you see something that kind of looks like a, a finch or a sparrow, but it's got that little dash of yellow, consider the pine siskin. And then our small raptors, we've got a, a prairie falcon and then also the American kestrel. Um, so there's a lot of birds that are out in the wintertime that are hunting. And again, it's a great time to go out and check them out because there's not a lot of leaves on trees right now. And so it's just great to get a clear picture of them, get them in your binoculars or see them in your neighborhood. Um, prairie falcons are gonna prefer something uh, that's got more wide open space, a pocket prairie even. So maybe it's not a very large prairie, but they wanna hunt over open grassland. And American kestrels are incredibly common all throughout the front range. And then you want to beware of feeder frenzy. So this kind of goes back to the ethics of feeding birds artificially. Uh, it can attract predators as well of smaller songbirds. And so this is a Cooper's hawk. And Cooper's hawks are known for hanging out on somebody's housetop and waiting for small birds to come down to feeders. And then they fly in and they pluck them off. So I want to encourage you, if you have a Cooper's hawk or another type of predator in and around your backyard, you don't have to leave your bird seat out. You can take that in. Um, your birds will move on, which is what you want, and go find other sources of food so that they can feed another day. 
And with that too, um, I just wanted to share again, the Great Backyard Bird Count. So this is the website. It's February 12th through the 15th, um, just birdcount.org. And you can go and observe birds in your backyard. You can observe birds in your local open space. Um, and all you have